Well, good evening, um, afternoon, and morning to all um, who are joining us. Uh, uh, it's Mitchell Warren from AVAC and delighted to welcome you all to this webinar with an update on HIV vaccines, which is timely um, all the time, we, we, we think, here at AVAC, but particularly so uh, because, as I think everyone will know, um, from the emails and the postings about this webinar. Uh, tomorrow, May 18th, uh, is officially uh, observed as HIV Vaccine Awareness Day. And um, I um, hope to provide just a little bit of context before introducing two fabulous colleagues to give perspectives on where the field is today and perhaps even more importantly where it's going into the future um, and then really open it up for the latter half of the call um, for a discussion and conversation with everybody on the line. Um, so thank you all for joining. Uh, people are on a global mute so we can keep the line clear for recording, but we really do want to hear from everybody. And I'll give some more detailed instructions uh, um, uh, after the two presentations. But basically, um, throughout the presentations, if you do have any questions at all, please do feel free to put them in the chat feature if you're online on ReadyTalk, uh, or you can email them at any point to avac at avac.org. Um, we'll put those in the queue, and as well, um, I'll give instructions on how to open up the line so people can um, be heard directly uh, themselves. Um, we are delighted though to have um, uh, two really um, special people, uh, important friends and colleagues to AVAC who um, I'll we'll introduce in just a minute, providing perspective. And I did just want to say um, for those who, who may be newer to this, um, the reason HIV Vaccine Awareness Day is on May 18th, because it's actually um, I think an important um, element in all of this. And um, uh, it, for those, uh, at least in the U.S., you will know that this time of year is often commencement season. It's when um, universities Universities and other schools finish their academic year. Um, and in 1997, on May 18th, uh, Bill Clinton, who was president at the time, um, made a remarkable speech at a, uh, at a commencement address at Morgan State University um, talking about what would be the 21st century as um, a, a century of science and really laid out a number of challenges and opportunities about um, science generally. And in particular, uh, he highlighted an HIV vaccine as um, a top priority in his administration, and it has continued to be a priority. Um, and uh, happily, even in the midst of um, political uncertainty and, and uh, um, challenges on politics and on funding, um, HIV vaccine research continues to be a priority. And uh, we use each year's May 18th to really recommit uh, ourselves as an organization, and as AVAC that started as the AIDS Vaccine Advocacy Coalition, um, as a constant reminder of the importance um, that we have to do all we can to deliver all the tools we have in treatment and prevention today, but we also have to um, be, be vigilant in maintaining a research and development agenda to ensure we have the tools for the long term, uh, which absolutely fundamentally uh, require an HIV vaccine. So we're delighted to welcome you all in, in that conversation. And I'm delighted to welcome two, as I say, great friends and colleagues to AVAC um, to provide their perspective. And um, we're going to start in just a minute with um, Sandy Vassen, who is with the U.S. Military HIV Research Program based in Thailand, and we're particularly um, happy, Sandy, that you're able to join us, what I know is at the end of a very long day uh, in, in Bangkok, um, and, and delighted to welcome you here. Um, and, and we'll first hear from Sandy and then from, from Mark Hubbard, who has been um, just a, a long-standing passionate advocate for research and development generally, and particularly for HIV vaccines. And um, Mark is uh, based in Nashville, but actually right now calling in from Washington, where he's just spent the last several days uh, as a real leader in the field at the HIV HIV Vaccine Trial Network meeting. And we're really excited to have both Sandy and Mark here to talk about um, where the field has come from and where it is going. And, and we'll start with Sandy, who is physically based in um, a, a really essential part of the story of HIV vaccine development, um, based in Bangkok uh, with the U.S. Military HIV Research Program. And you all will know, and, and, and Sandy's going to give an update, um, starting with, with RV144, a trial that now finished uh, um, almost um, – uh, nine years ago now, um, and the RV stands for retrovirus, uh, uh, but it was a uh, clinical trial that was led by the MHRP in partnership with the um, Thai government and um, really gave us as a global community the first sense that um, an HIV vaccine was actually possible. And so, Sandy, we are so happy um, to welcome you onto the call to give an update on, on where things stand and where things are going in terms of vaccine development. Thanks very much, Mitchell, for that kind introduction, and uh, hi, everyone. I'm Sandy from the U.S. 
Military HIV Research Program, and I really like to thank Mitchell and Stacy and AVAC for the organizing this very important event this year and every year, and for the opportunity to share some perspective on the state of HIV vaccine development as it stands today in 2018 and where we hope to go from here. So I believe that you all will be advancing my slides. Can we have the next slide? I don't know if there's, oh, there we go, okay. So I'll try and limit my remarks to 15 minutes or so to allow time for discussion, but I'll touch on where we are in follow-up to the RV144 trial and then considerations and challenges for moving forward. So next slide. I was told that many of you on the phone today are pretty familiar with the HIV vaccine history, so I'll cover this background fairly quickly, but please bring up any questions you may have in the Q&A session afterwards. The RV144 trial, as many of you know, was a phase three clinical trial conducted in over 16,000 people here in Thailand from 2003 to 2009 in men and women aged 18 to 30 who were at risk for HIV. They received a combination of two vaccines over six months, AIDSVAX, which is a protein-based vaccine, made by Global Solutions for Infectious Diseases, and ALVAC, a viral vaccine made by Sanofi Pasteur, uh, or they received matched placebo. And both of these vaccines contain gene sequences matched to the HIV subtype circulating in Thailand, which is subtype AE. All the participants were followed for three and a half years in order to determine the rates of HIV infection in both the vaccine and the placebo groups. So on the next slide, um, the results from RV144 were announced back in 2009, but the reason that we keep talking about this trial and that it still serves as an anchor in the field today is because it remains the only HIV vaccine efficacy trial of the five completed efficacy trials conducted to date to have shown any protection. So in this graph, we can see the rate of HIV infection over the trial period in the placebo recipients in blue and in the vaccine recipients in green. Next slide. So at the end of three and a half years, 74 people were infected in the, uh, with HIV in the placebo group, but only 51 were infected in the vaccine group, which translated to a 31% efficacy of the vaccine regimen in preventing HIV. So on one hand, this was disappointing, as the government of Thailand had agreed to license a vaccine that was at least 50% efficacious. But on the other hand, it provided much needed hope at the time that it was possible to achieve protection from HIV with a preventative vaccine. So we just have to figure out how to make it better. Next slide, please. So how do we get from 31% to at least 50%? On the graph, you'll see a theoretical depiction of what we think was happening in RV144. So specifically, we believe that the vaccines induced uh, a protective immune response, but that it simply didn't last long enough. And this is because the vaccine achieved 60% efficacy at 12 months or six months after the last vaccination, and that waned to 31% over time. So one strategy to overcome this waning efficacy would be to provide an additional booster vaccination, kind of like an annual flu shot, to keep immune responses high consistently. However, to do this, we need to understand which immune responses may have been involved in the protection so that we can ensure that they remain higher in the next generation of vaccines. Next slide. So in a major collaborative effort, multiple research groups got together after RV144 and compared different immune responses between the RV144 participants who received either vaccine or placebo. And what you can see here on the upper left is a schematic of the HIV virus, which contains a protein called GP120 on the surface or the envelope of HIV shown in purple. And when you blow up the structure of this GP120 protein on the upper right, it's composed of several different variable loops named V1 through V5. And so researchers measured immune responses to different parts of the HIV envelope by isolating them into pieces, such as the isolated V1, V2 loop sequence shown at the bottom. Next slide. So of the wide array of immune responses that were analyzed, antibody responses to V1, V2 stood out the most. As you can see in the graph, the subset of vaccine recipients with high antibodies to V1, V2, shown in the blue dotted line at the bottom, had the lowest rates of HIV infection. 
So this gave us at least one target on which to focus our efforts to develop a vaccine with improved efficacy. Next slide. So with all that by way of background, now let me share with you where we are in our follow-up efforts to RV144 today. Next slide. Because RV144 was so large and therefore so expensive, we only collected and stored blood from participants. Since then, um, and I arrived in Thailand in 2011 when these follow-up trials were starting, we've been conducting trials in Thailand which are not full efficacy trials, but which allow us to look at the immune responses in more than just the blood in the places where HIV first enters the body during sexual transmission. So in these follow-up trials, we asked a subset of willing volunteers to, um, in addition, this was an extra voluntary procedure, to provide cervical secretions by insertion of a soft cup, a semen by masturbation, or rectal secretions by inserting a small sponge via an anoscope. And we were very happy that the acceptance rate of these procedures was quite high because before the trial started, we were told that they may not be very well accepted um, in the Thai population. So it's really a testament to the dedication of our trial volunteers and our clinical staff and our community advisory boards who provided guidance on how best to approach Thai volunteers about in discussing these procedures. And of course, the high uptake rate helped us make maximal use of the data coming from these trials. Next slide. So in the interest of time, I'm going to jump right into the conclusions of what we learned from these trials so far. In the RV305 trial, 162 people uh, were uh, called back who were participants in the original RV144 trial, and these were people who had been randomized to receive vaccinations and not placebo. And so six to eight years later, these people came back in for a new trial and got two more vaccination with either the AIDSVAX, the ALVAC, or both together. And we're very happy to see that boosting with the AIDSVAX protein, either alone or in combination, increased the immune responses in the blood, including the V1, V2 response, even higher than in the peak of RV144. And so this told us that despite this long six to eight year interval, there was an immunologic memory that had been laid down in RV144 so that memory was recalled when the vaccine boosting occurred. It also helped us shape future product design because we found that boosting with just the ALVAC alone, the viral component, did not boost immune responses. So we knew that the protein was required to do this. And so a wide array of detailed immunologic testing has also helped us to understand that the functions of the antibodies are broader and more effective and have more neutralizing-like qualities after late boosting. And very importantly, that these antibodies can be detected at all mucosal sites that I'd mentioned in the previous slide. So that's all very encouraging. Next slide. Um, however, obviously six to eight years is a long time to wait between um, a vaccine and a booster. So we wanted to ensure that boosting earlier at a more practical time point or schedule would still be beneficial. And that led us to the RV306 trial, where 360 naive, healthy Thai volunteers in Bangkok and Chiang Mai were vaccinated with the six-month RV144 vaccine series, or placebo, and then boosted with the protein AIDSVAX, either alone or with ALVAC, at months 12, 15, or 18. And some of these data are fairly new, so I'm happy to share them here. Uh, like in RV305, the Late boosting improved the immune responses, which we ex expected, both in the blood and, again, in the mucosa. Um, but interestingly, waiting longer seems to Im improve the boosting effect, so that boosting at month 15 or 18 seems to be a bit better than boosting at month 12. But where we continue to fall short in these trials and, and as a field as a whole is in achieving durability as the immune responses that we generate still fall off quite quickly. But nevertheless, the data being generated from these follow-up trials is invaluable in helping us build the next generation of vaccines. Next slide. So in parallel to these efforts in Thailand that I've been describing, the RV144 regimen was tested in South Africa in the HBTN 097 trial, which showed relatively equivalent immune responses to the same products in South Africans. This was then followed by the HVTN100 trial, which used a version of the RV144 vaccines that were modified to match the HIV subtype C circulating strains in South Africans. 
and also incorporated a new adjuvant called MF59, made by Novartis, to boost immune responses. And lastly, added this additional late boosting vaccination at month 12. So results from this HVTN100 trial met the pre-specified what we call go-no-go no go criteria for immunogenicity, meaning that the immune responses were sufficient enough to warrant proceeding to a full efficacy trial, HVTN702. Next slide. So a schematic of this trial, there it is, you can see on the left, which depicts the additional month 12 vaccination at the bottom of the timeline in the red and the blue. This trial is ongoing now at multiple sites in South Africa, and the goal for this study is to achieve at least 50% per protection from HIV, uh, but we won't get results until 2021, um, and that's still a bit of a moving target. As you can see from the size and the cost of these trials, this is why efficacy trials are relatively infrequent and require so much advanced planning. Next slide. So given that, um, it's actually highly encouraging that we, right now we have two parallel HIV vaccine efficacy trials ongoing in progress because the HVTN705 trial has just begun in South Africa and is testing a different approach by using vaccines with so-called mosaic antigens. And as the name suggests, these are based on sequences that are pieced together like a mosaic via computer design to theoretically protect against a broad range of HIV subtypes. And this would provide hope for a universal, more global HIV vaccine rather than different regional vaccines. The results for this trial will be available in 2022, not too far behind the HVTN702 results. And the boost in this trial is with a subtype C protein matched to circulating HIV strains in South Africa. But Janssen Pharmaceuticals is in the planning stages of a future global efficacy trial which would use a mosaic protein boost and be tested in multiple regions around the world. So taken together, it's actually a time for hope and optimism, as Mitch opened the call with. Um, next slide. So I'd like to switch gears a little bit and talk about how HIV vaccine development merges into other efforts going forward. Um, because we've all, uh, or at least in the scientific research community, we've been guilty in the past of being a bit siloed into vaccines or PrEP, microbicides, et cetera. But as a result of our collective successes across these venues, the time has come where we need to be increasingly cognizant of where our efforts fit into the larger landscape of HIV prevention. Next slide. So with this table, my intent here is not to review the studies in detail, but to note that HIV vaccine efficacy trials that I just described are occurring in the context of a number of other ev efficacy trials evaluating alternate means of preventing HIV infection in high-risk populations, um, specifically antiretroviral therapy in the form of daily PrEP or long-acting injectable drug formulations such as cabotegravir, microbicides such as the depivering ring, which has already shown partial effect efficacy in other studies, and monoclonal antibodies such as the AMP trial, which is another ongoing efficacy trial in southern Africa testing VRC01, and PrepVac, which is plan, a planned study combining the use of PrEP and vaccines. Um, so again, I don't want to go through any of these trials in detail, but the main point I want to emphasize here is that these are not competitive endeavors, even though in a um, time of funding shortages and things, it can sometimes feel that way. But really, we're, we're all here to support each other because likely what we need ultimately to prevent HIV is a diverse menu of prevention options, much like the existing range of options for birth control. And um, we continue to hang on to a vaccine as a holy grail, as something that um, should be the least affected by the need for continued adherence. But in order to test future HIV vaccines, we need to continue to identify novel high-risk populations to understand current incidents. Next slide. So as I've mentioned, both um, ongoing efficacy trials as well as the AMP trial are being conducted in southern Africa where the burden of HIV infection hits hardest globally. However, given that 97% of HIV infections in the U.S. military are subtype B, which is found mainly in the Americas, Europe, Australia, the U.S. Army is expanding its research focus now to include testing of RV144-like vaccine regimens in subtype B regions as well, 
while continuing to bridge to the RV144 results by testing in Thailand. So this slide depicts a number of relatively newer sites where we're conducting so-called cohort studies in both Germany and Thailand following men who have sex with men and transgender women who are at high risk for HIV to understand the incidence of HIV infection over time. Interestingly, in some of our Thai sites, as high as a third of the participants uh, identify as transgender women. Next slide. So this raises a very important question about the biology of HIV transmission among transgender women. Um, many prior efficacy trials of vaccines and other products have studied MSM and transgender women in aggregate without being adequately, adequately powered to conduct distinct subgroup analyses to more formally understand differences in transmission between these two groups. It's been reported that global rates of HIV transmission are higher among transgender women, but there hasn't been a whole lot of research on whether this is due to specific bio biologic influences such as hormone therapy or gender affirmation surgery um, or just um, purely due to changes in or differences in behavioral risk. So we started to look into this in partnership with the Sister Center for Transgenders, um, an NGO in Patia, which is a city two hours south of Bangkok which a high, with a high rate of commercial sex work. And so in this very early pilot data we presented in CROI, the CROI conference in February, you can see that the cellular composition of neovaginal cells in transgender women differs from vaginal cells in cisgender women, um, and that there may be a higher percentage of CD4 positive, CCR5 positive target cells for HIV in the sigmoid or gut tissue of transgender women than in MSM. But I want to be exceedingly cautious here about over, over interpretation of this early pilot data as these analyses are ongoing and we're adding more numbers. Um, but I chose to um, share this here to show you that even as we wait for results of efficacy trials, there's really a lot of continuous ongoing work uh, both at the community level and at the basic science level to prepare ourselves for the next generation of efficacy trials. Next slide. So finally, I just want to end with a few brief thoughts on the importance of continued stakeholder engagement, which I realize is a bit like preaching to the choir in this forum, but nevertheless still can never be underemphasized. Next slide. Um, so we as scientists and researchers and clinical developers can get easily caught up in our work without remembering to pick our heads up and share the importance and the excitement of what we're doing with the many, many diverse groups involved in making an HIV vaccine. And so again, in a time of funding challenges within HIV research, it's critical that we, may, we remain a uni unified in our voice to advocate for continued support of all of the efforts we um, need to maintain to improve prevention against infection from HIV. So uh, in my final slide, next slide please, one major way in which we as a scientific research community can contribute to this effort is to engage in a continuous process of results dissemination to ensure that our community and advocate partners such as yourselves are fully informed and armed with the information you need to perform the critical roles you play in this journey with maximal effectiveness. So what I've chosen to show here is an event we held in Thailand just last week to share clinical trial results with a wide variety of stakeholders. And the event was opened by the US Ambassador to Thailand with the Thai Vice Minister for Public Health and the Royal Thai Army Surgeon General. So we're truly grateful for this high level show of support for HIV vaccine development. And I'm always inspired by the African proverb that sits on my desk that says, if you want to go fast, go alone, and if you want to go far, go together. So with that, I thank you all for your attention and for the opportunity to speak, and I'm thrilled to take questions. Great. Sandy, thank you so much. That was terrific, and questions have come. Uh, but before we get to those, I want to um, turn first to Mark Hubbard, and it's the perfect entry point in terms of where you ended in terms of, of, of your presentation to shift to Mark, who um, many of you know um, as a leading advocate and community educator, um, has been very involved with the Retrovirus Conference with CROI as a community liaison um, a committee member for, for a number of years, and very importantly, 
for purposes of this talk today, um, has been a leader in the uh, um, global cab uh, and local cabs related to the HIV vaccine trials network. And I'm really delighted to welcome Mark here um, to provide a perspective uh, um, as well in terms of lessons learned and, and challenges ahead. So Mark, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Mitch. And I, Mitchell, I really appreciate the opportunity. And thank you, Sandy, for a terrific overview. And I want to get a shout out to Stacy for her mentoring and support as I sort of expanded my knowledge of in community engagement uh, to the scope of good participatory practices. So next slide. Um, and I'm going to start with the basics, and some of this will uh, be basic for a lot of you, but I think it's important to lay a foundation. And I'm going to be a little bit provocative, hopefully, too, so we have some discussion. Um, you know, why stakeholder engagement? Well, from day one in the pandemic, it was just the right thing to do. And as we said then, research should be done with us, not on us or to us. And the reality is we've proven that the result is better research in terms of higher productivity, more useful results, a reduced risk of futility, and more success in terms of what happens after the trial. Uh, next slide. And so what do we mean by stakeholder engagement? Well, that depends on some fun foundational values that have been around for a very long time. And that is that stakeholders who are impacted by research must be meaningfully involved. And when I say stakeholders, I don't just mean participants, but other individuals, groups, and institutions who are impacted uh, where we're doing the research. And they should be involved in all aspects of the research. So, you know, if your community engagement is just about getting people into trials via community education and recruiting efforts, that's not stakeholder engagement. Uh, stakeholders must also be engaged in terms of setting the agenda and priorities, helping to design the trials, informing uh, the informed consent processes, and helping to disseminate the results so you have better uptake of a, of a useful product. And this involvement must occur across the entire timeline. So uh, stakeholder engagement should begin from before the trial design is finalized all the way through to after the publication of the primary results. Next. And, you know, as Sandy said, this costs money, but you cannot do it without the Qing. So, uh, you know, first of all, and this is an area that I think we need to pay attention to, there has to be dedicated staff support. One of the mistakes I've seen made over the years is for um, an effort to say, well, we're going to make so-and-so the staff liaison, and that person already has a full-time job, and they're just getting another responsibility added to their job description. That will not get it done. There needs to be hours and dollars dedicated to these uh, stakeholder engagement efforts. And, of course, this work requires material and equipment and space, access to Internet, um, printing, uh, boardrooms, whatever you need to get this done. And there needs to be an investment to remove barriers for those who need help with travels, people need to be fed, and there can be other things that can help remove those barriers. Next slide. And so, um, you know, we talked about community advisory boards, and obviously I'm someone who values them highly as someone who's been doing that work since uh, about 1999, both at the site and the network level. So they're long established, so they're very valuable, but what we've learned is alone or in isolation, they are not enough. We must use other groups, other methods, and other forms of cons consultation to maximize the value of stakeholder engagement. Next. So we have uh, standards of care and treatment. Uh, we talk about a standard of prevention in uh, particularly uh, recently in HIV, and I'll talk more about that, but we also have a standard of stakeholder engagement, and that's good participatory practice. And that's a comprehensive structural framework built on these longstanding values and synthesizing decades of collective experience and expertise. And so lots of people from lots of fronts were involved in writing uh, these guidelines, um, and they're there to help us create the standard of engagement. Next. So um, I want to talk about something that's very experiential uh, for me, which comes from observing different um, engagement groups and processes and systems over time. And I think there's a spectrum of how we do that, and I'm going to illustrate the extremes. And so on the one end, we have 
an effort or a group that is small, has fewer participants. They're generally very highly invested in the work, but they're sort of in a sink or swim situation because they have limited support, they don't have a formal structure, and they end up being pioneering, which is a good thing, uh, but it's not a perfect model. On the other end, we have what I call the spoon-fed model, where there are a lot of participants receiving generous support, uh, working under a formal structure. In general, what I observe is those folks tend to be in a more passive relationship with the work and therefore have a lower investment level. Next. And so both of those ends of the spe spectrum contain attributes that can be useful, but what I find is if a group or effort is at the extremes, it's going to be less productive, whereas if we find that happy medium in the middle, we're going to see maximum productivity in terms of stakeholder engagement and its support of the research enterprise. Next. So I want to talk a little bit about silos and bridges, and thank you for Sandy, uh, to Sandy for sort of breaking that ice. Just out of curiosity, I flipped over to the HIV.gov website the other day, and I noticed on their calendar there are 13 awareness days. Um, next. Next slide. So today we're commemorating HIV Vaccine Awareness Day, and I think that's very important. Next slide. But I was prompted to ask these questions. As Sandy said, is vaccine research in 2018 just about vaccines? Well, we know that's not the case. We are in the field as advocates and activists talking about PrEP and the role that has in the conduct of our trials. The vaccine network is now actively involved and will continue to be very involved in testing antibodies both uh, to inform vaccine research, but also as a possible complement to vaccines uh, to prevent HIV. And vaccines are playing key roles, both in sort of uh, conventional chronic treatment uh, research, as well as uh, in the search for curative therapies. So I have to ask, what other awareness day should be on the calendar, or should we consider broadening that vision to something like an HIV research awareness day? Next slide. And as Sandy said, we're all working together. We've seen this. It hasn't happened overnight, but it certainly has become more dramatic in recent years, and we must work together in a mutually beneficial way. And when I say this, I'm talking about other networks, institutions, and priority groups, and I'll give two concrete examples. And so um, I was on a call a couple of months ago with some folks who are working very hard to find ways to achieve curative therapies, and they are having to think about prevention in terms of taking HIV-positive participants off of treatment until their viral load rises, and therefore they become potentially infectious. And they were having a lot of angst about PrEP, and what I was able to say, as someone has a foot in each field, you guys need to talk to the vaccine folks and the prevention folks because we've been having this discussion, and while we don't have all the answers, a lot of your failures and concerns have been addressed, so let's connect you all. Conversely, in a session at the HIV Vaccine Trials Network Conference yesterday, I heard how some groundbreaking work on laboratory tests in the curative therapy field or in the cure field may be critical to interpreting data from the AMP trial. So this really demonstrates the importance of of this. Other bridges I think to need to be built are between stakeholder groups that are embedded. So CABs, for instance, inside the NIH networks at the site and network level, and groups that are outside uh, of those networks or of those systems, even in pharma and industry. Uh, obviously, AVAC is one, and there are others. And if we're not talking to each other, we're not maximizing our effectiveness. Um, I also think we need to always remember that there are community organizations and stakeholders who have not been traditionally focused on HIV research or in directly engaged in research advocacy who have a lot to offer in terms of helping us get the work done. They often have social capital, existing relationships with the community, lots of trust in the community, and also can do a really great job of helping us translate what we're trying to do into what works really on the ground in the populations we most need to reach. Next slide. So, I mean, this may seem obvious, but as I think about this, I think that we have built 
stakeholder engagement cultures based on the history. So the way that stakeholder engagement over time has evolved in a treatment network can be very different than it's evolved in a vaccine network which can be very different in, than what exists in industry and pharma. And, you know, it's fundamental that we get to know each other, these histories and our, our uh, cultures so that we can link them in a strategic and collaborative way. Next slide. So let's always ask ourselves, is our stakeholder engagement broad and thorough enough um, this is a bone I have to pick, and people are going to hear me say this over and over who hang out with me. What are we doing to recruit the next generation of advocates? I'd love to know the average age of the folks on this call. I know that the average age that I see in rooms that are engaged in advocacy and activism is not what I'd like to see and doesn't reflect who we most need to reach. I also think we need to constantly think about how do we integrate the outsiders, the people who are new, the people who are naive, uh, the people who challenge us on our basic ideas and concepts, because we're, if we're only working with people that we already know, if we're only putting ourselves into discussions that are comfortable, if there's not dissent, if there's not some controversy, I don't think we can be as innovative as we need to be. Next. We need to recognize that the research agenda changes over time. And you know, the narrative in vaccine research really, really illustrates this. I'm thinking back to the 505 trial, which started out as a large trial um, in men who have sex with men, initially not envisioned as a true efficacy trial. The decision was made to expand it, to turn it into an efficacy trial, which meant that stakeholders had to understand that. And about the same time, PrEP became on the market, and that was integrated into the trial. So all of a sudden, people who really had been advocating for trials that looked kind of the same based on some simple knowledge of immunology and vaccinology had to learn about antiretroviral therapy and how that was going to be used in prevention. Uh, once that trial was completed, they had to adapt to the fact that many sites were only doing earlier phase trials and how to make that relevant for the communities that they were part of. And then obviously most recently, as the vaccine network picked up a large efficacy trial of antibodies, there was more science to learn. Next. So I'm going to uh, talk just a little bit um, to generate discussion. What I would say are the two key issues most on our minds in vaccine research uh, today in 2018. And the first is what is the standard of prevention? This is not a new conversation, but it's very current. We've done some of the work, but work remains. And the first part of that I would say is how should the standard of prevention within a trial compared to that in the community at large? Should the standard be higher? Should it be the same? Should it be lower? And this boils down to the question of, uh, for me, is it our role as a research enterprise to follow or to lead in terms of the standard of prevention? Um, this conversation is not new. I remember back when we were first doing antiretroviral treatment trials in resource limited settings, and people said, you know, what are you going to do after the trial and the treatment goes away? Is there competence and infrastructure to support this? But I think it would be fair to say the decision was made to lead. Uh, my, uh, my careful vision of what's happening now is that we are leading with prevention, but there's some controversy about how we're doing that, and there's certainly some nuance to the discussion. Next slide. And, of course, the biggest part of that right now is whether or not Truvado's PrEP is the standard of prevention for the vaccine trials and other prevention trials uh, of products like antibodies that we're conducting. Um, I think if you have to boil it down, we've sort of gone in the direction of yes, but as I said, there's more nuance to this, and there are more products that may come to market as we conduct these trials. And so those questions are, where is it going to be the standard of prevention? When does it become the standard of prevention where it isn't already? And how do we implement that? So do we just tell people PrEP exists? Do we actively refer them for PrEP? Or do we provide complete, competent PrEP services uh, within the context of the trial itself? And like I say, those decisions are being made. They're not monolithic. They're nuanced. Uh, and we have to move forward with this on our mind. Next. Um, and, and the reality for this discussion and a broader discussion leads us to this second issue. 
The reality is, as the effectiveness of our combined prevention methods and our standard of prevention rises, then the risk that a trial will be futile and not find the yes or no answer to efficacy rises as well. This was always there. Um, it's there now, but to a lesser degree because uptake of these new methods is not dramatic, but it's always on our mind and we have to think about this very hard. And so how do we continue to conduct these trials in a way that will answer that question of whether or not the product uh, is effective? Next slide. Uh, I think there's two major avenues of discussion right now. The first is, can we use exclusion criteria and investor dis uh, investigator discretion or recruitment messaging in a way that's actually ethical uh, with the goal of reducing the number of persons who are using PrEP or other biomedical prevention products in a vaccine trial? I do not have an answer for this. What I can tell you is it's complicated and it's controversial and we need to continue the discussion. Next slide. And then the more stark uh, avenue of discussion along these lines is how do we find alternate trial designs that can be used to ward off this possibility or likelihood of futility. These discussions are also uh, ongoing, but a little bit more difficult because who's involved. And so I have a list of folks that I think we must have engaged if we're going to accelerate uh, this process of sort of deciding on some alternate trial designs that are acceptable all around. And of course, we start with the experts, the research entities with the most experience, uh, experts in trial design and statistical analysis uh, who have a lot to bring to the conversation. If we don't have regulatory folks, uh, and that's usually governments involved, we are uh, dead in our tracks. So this is a conversation. And then end users and participants, so stakeholder engagement at the ground level and civil society at large is very important. And I can tell you this is already playing out in cure research. Um, uh, advocates had conversations with the FDA that had concrete effects in terms of what was allowed and what trial designs look like. And it was a two-way conversation, just exactly what we like to see in that both sides learned from each other and a compromise was found. And one final note, that process is being aided by community-driven research. So advocates and cure research did their own studies based on surveys in order to help the FDA understand what risk was acceptable to the community and how important cure research was to the community in order to assess the balance of risk in given trials. And with that, I'll finish up and leave as much uh, time as possible for discussion. And thanks for the opportunity. Great, Mark. Thank you so much. That was terrific, both um, yours and Sandy's, to set the stage for not just the discussion over the next 20 minutes or so, but actually for, for our collaborations across um, the board. Um, so thank you both so very, very much. Um, some amazing questions have already come in. <clears throat> I'm going to get to those straight away. You can continue to put them in the ReadyTalk box. Uh, email them to avac at avac.org, and then in a minute or two or a few minutes, I'll, I'll go ahead and open up the line to hear anybody's voices that want, want to engage. Age. Um, lots of great questions across both presentations. Let me start, I think, maybe with a couple back to you, Sandy, um, and, and try to try hear a couple of questions that came in together. Um, and, and they relate to some of the numbers you used. So um, you said at some point about kind of really trying to get to 50% um, in the follow-up to RV144, beyond the 31% that was observed in, in the trial itself. And so a couple of questions I'll give to you all at once. Um, what makes 50% the magic number? Um, is that you know is that kind of written down somewhere? So so what's magic about that? Um, what happens if it doesn't achieve 50% efficacy, and what do you think will happen? And then finally, and this is, I'm, I'm super excited because it's from a brand new AVAC advocacy fellow uh, based in Zimbabwe who's asking, I think, a really important question um, about the potential need for um, annual boosting. And if you really can't um, get this durability beyond 12 months, um, what is the practicality and implications um, of, of a vaccine that would require um, an annual dose. So uh, a couple of questions are thrown together, but I wonder if you might be able to um, answer them all together. Absolutely. Thank you. Those are brilliant, brilliant questions. Um, you're spot on insightful uh, that there is no magic number. 50% is a target. 
and um, it's really actually quite complex because ultimately what's going to happen is that the determination for licensing a vaccine will depend on the, um, the burden of the epidemic in each nation, the resources of each nation, and also the decision on whether you license it for everyone in the population or uh, target it to those who may be higher risk. And you know there are entire disciplines of economics that, that analyze these things. So I actually talked to a mathematical modeler um, at Yale University who felt that um, RV144 could have been licensed. Because the other thing that's very arbitrary is when do you define efficacy? RV144, had, you know, was, we followed people for three years after the last vaccination, a total of three and a half years. And so at what point do you stop the trial and say this is what the efficacy is? So, um, you know, 50% is a target goal that we put together and Tony Fauci uses as a general number. But I think uh, to answer question number two there, that if the efficacy for one of these uh, trials is less than 50%, but there's still efficacy, 40%, let's say, then there would be a, an intense analysis to try and understand whether that would still be worth licensing in some subgroup uh, versus trying to then continue to build upon it with the next generation of vaccines. Um, and then I think the final question you mentioned, can you remind me what the final question was, Mitch? Oh, about the, the, you know, the implications of needing an annual boost if it only oh. you know, lasts 12 or 15 months, how, that would, how feasible that would be, and what are the implications um, in terms of a practical vaccination programs? Right. Uh, well, the implications are obviously more cost and uh, less adherence in terms of trying to find people who are high, high risk or maybe mobile or, um, you know, to, to get them to stay compliant with booster vaccinations. But, uh, you know, where we are now, if you think about where we're, what we're looking at with PrEP or even capitagravir with injections every few months, um, getting to an injection at 12 months would be a near-term goal that would, you know, just take us leaps and bounds from where we are now, which is nothing. So it's not the end state. The end state is to try and keep um, improving upon the durability. And one, I mean, there's so much more I could have touched on. I apologize that I went so quickly. But uh, one exciting concept that is getting more and more steam, it's been around for a while, is this concept of things called adjuvants. But there's a wider array of adjuvants, which are substances we can mix with the vaccine products to improve um, not just the, the height of the uh, immune responses, but hopefully also the durability. So, you know, we're, we're just setting, differentiating short-term goals from long-term goals. Great. Now that's super helpful. And, and speaking of numbers, let me just continue one other set of questions here. You talked about some follow-ons, um, Sandy, of RV144 in Thailand and RV305 and 306, and, and really interesting um, insights and, and learning from those trials. And a question came in, how are those being fed into the HVTN, a different organization running HVTN702? And, and, and so one question is just what, how, how are you, the learnings and the results of the one study being fed into the other, and more broadly, maybe a, a, a follow-on question: How, in your mind, having spent a number of years, you know, in the field in, of vaccine research, your sense of the way in which the research community is working today, perhaps compared to the way it may have worked uh, in years past? Wow, these are great questions. How fun! Um, so. It's funny because some of you know, and I think Mark is there, that the HVTN meeting in Washington, D.C. is on this week. And so uh, there have been – we probably don't do a good, jo good enough job of advertising it, that, uh, which is why I made one remark that ultimately, although it could have the danger of appearing that we, there's a competitive nature to some of this, we ultimately really are working together. So just this week we had um, – a series of meetings with the, the P5 uh, and 4 o'clock in the morning local time I was on the phone with a, a room full of people including Larry Corey and, and uh, you know, the MHRP where we were reviewing data from these trials and talking together about how these things might work together to inform the next generation of trials. So there is a constant uh, communication, but as you, you, you know, we probably don't do enough a good job of advertising it.
Great. Now, thank you so much. That's super, super helpful, Sandy. Um, Mark, a couple questions came in, and and some of it, and and uh, it was flagged by a couple of your comments about um, community engagement and stakeholder engagement, and then trials and and sites that are very focused on recruiting for for trials themselves. And a question came in about, um, you know, how do you think about and communicate the differences between what we might think of as engagement uh, at, a, at a community or stakeholder level compared to recruiting actual trial participants? And, and just any thoughts on that you might have. Thanks, Mitchell. I think, you know what, that's a very fine line. And I will say that at the ground level, folks who serve on community advisory boards really do see that the work they do helps uh, recruitment. And so what I would say, the difference that I try to explain to CAB members is if you're raising awareness, you're not recommending or attempting to influence or in any way uh, giving a message that's trying to get an individual person into an individual trial. Um, you are educating them about the opportunity. And so that's at the, uh, uh, there are people who get paid to recruit. That's the other thing I always say. And it's their job to sort of be a little further on that boundary of talking to individuals about a specific trial and the need for participants to go into that trial. But it is more subtle than that. And I think the biggest thing is that the other things that I pointed out on that slide are very, very important. And so, you know, uh, people who are uh, stakeholders need to be involved in those things like trial design, mm -hmm. Uh, what does an informed consent look like? Uh, you know, how do we roll out a product? Uh, how do we discuss things uh, in an informed consent context? There are lots of other roles for those folks to play. Great. Mark, thanks. That's su such a great um, perspective. Um, I want, there's a question that kind of evolves for I think both of you, Sandy and Mark, and, and it actually uh, begins, Sandy, with uh, a number of people uh, noted um, with great enthusiasm and, and really congratulations to you about um, the, the really interesting, although you, are, you, you made it clear, early work around the biology of transmission uh, in transgender women and perhaps the differences. And because so often um, of recent years, the, the, the challenge of, of, of really understanding enough data around transgender women different from, from MSM and, and very often lumped together in data. Um, but given that it's very early research, a question came in of um, what else is planned in this area to build on your initial data? Um, what should advocates be aware of to perhaps push this agenda? Um, and a related issue, um, Mark, you know, thinking about language and, and identification, and, and I think uh, someone else who was at the VTN meeting just wrote in and said, you know, this conversation about populations and how they're defined and how trials and networks might refer to them. So, you know, we think about um, sex workers as, as population, and, and yet um, they're also heterosexual women in the community, and, and this issue of, of labels and um, engagement. So I wonder if both of you might want to comment on both the specifics of next steps in research and then how we might think and communicate around this going forward. Mark, you want to start? Um, okay, if I must. Uh, can you hear me? <laughs> okay, good. Yes, go ahead. Um, no, no, it's a difficult question. What I would say is this conversation is evolving. I was in a training yesterday that had to do with uh, dealing with people who identify as trans or non-binary or genderqueer in a clinical setting. But what I say is that there, there are different dimensions to this. So from a scientific viewpoint, there is the dimensions of physiology, um, and biology from a community standpoint and from a risk analysis standpoint. Um, there are other aspects and people identify in more than one way depending on how you ask the questions or what context you're serving in. And I know Mitchell knows that we have had some questions with other uh, colleagues about uh, calling people or groups that they're a part of high risk. And some of us are moving to language like vulnerable, but none of that is concrete. And so I think part of this is bringing more folks to the table and ask, asking them how they identify. This is a great part of the stakeholder engagement that we're talking about. And I think we just need to keep advocating for inclusion, both in terms of trial participation in all phases and um, in stakeholder engagement processes. Sandy? 
So um, I was going to give a very similar answer, um, and that you know, from a research perspective, as we're entering new fields, we do so very gingerly and in complete and open, constant communication with our partners. And in this case, that's why I highlighted this one particular NGO called Sisters, um, because we really want to feel that we're doing research with the community based on the needs and questions that they have, not just on our own questions. We've had focus groups with them and talked about the things that they want to talk about and um, um, went through sensitivity training before we engaged even in our pilot studies. Um, but we're constantly learning and trying to adapt. And you know, I would add to all of the things that Mark just said so eloquently that we also have to think about um, differences in these groups across cultures because um, without going into examples because of the time, um, we found that things that or, or terminology that might be acceptable to the transgender community in Patia is not acceptable to the transgender community in New York, et cetera. So um, as with everything, there, there are a number of nuances. Another interesting anecdote is that uh, the cohort studies that we're conducting right now that I alluded to in Thailand, um, one of the inclusion criteria for a number of reasons is um, male sex at birth. Um, yet on the gender form, we had um, male, female, or transgender. And um, a large, uh, not large, but a significant fraction of people who um, identified as female rather than uh, transgender woman. And uh, Thailand is, um, at least in certain circles, very good about um, supporting the concept of gender fluidity. So, you know, how do you capture that in a box for, for research statistics you, and, and bring in the human element into the pra practical things you need to know for clinical trials operations? We're constantly dealing with those balances and those struggles, but just trying to be as self-aware and listen as much as we can. Fantastic. Um, really so uh, helpful for what you're both describing. Um, one other science question. I realize we're at the near the top of the hour, but um, a lot of great stuff coming in. Um, someone commented, you know, as you presented, Sandy, there is a lot of enthusiasm because we have these two efficacy trials of vaccine candidates that you described, and then also the enthusiasm around antibody uh, research as well. Um, but a question about what else, and in terms of the pipeline, and, and you know, it, it, there's no certainty with just because it's an efficacy trial that it will work. Um, it both it may not be ideal. Um, Candidates long term, as you described, they may be good near term, but the long, but what's for the long term? So a question about, and this is really to both of you, what's your your, your sense right now of the pipeline of of opportunities in vaccine candidates earlier, and also how might we think about choosing what goes next into efficacy trials? Is it a question of fewer doses because these other ones have many more? You know, what what might be the thought around you know where where we are and how we might make choices? So from the research perspective, there, uh, I really did a disservice to the amazing number of things that are coming up in uh, either preclinical work, animal work, um, or even phase one trials. Uh, but there's a lot going on in terms of new immunogens that might be uh, far more effective at inducing what we call neutralizing antibodies. And um, yeah, I, I think the down selection question is, is critical and will probably come down to the, the rea real constraints of, um, you know, you can only fund so many to go so far into efficacy trials, and that's where we just debate as a community. There, there are certainly no standardized guidelines or, or anything written, but that's what these ongoing scientific conferences and meetings are about, is constantly refining what we're thinking about for the future. I will also say that to conduct an efficacy trial, as Mark alluded to, you know, you're, you're conducting them in, um, it's this catch-22 where you want to follow people to see who, who gets, um, you know, whether there's a reduction in the number of HIV infections and in people who are receiving this novel and exciting intervention. Um, but at the same time, you want to counsel people and do everything you can to, at an individual level, make sure they don't get infected with HIV. So that's a tough balance that will continue to shift over time, what I alluded to in the the idea of the changing landscape, because as we get more successful with a wider array of prevention modalities, it'll become harder to do these efficacy trials. Absolutely. Mark, anything you want to add on one? 
Uh, yes, yeah, several things, actually. One is that I think this is a great argument for uh, integrating social and behavioral science into our studies. In other words, finding out uh, what people feel about the studies that we are doing in terms of sort of those practical considerations you mentioned, like dosing and mode of delivery, whether it's a pill, an injectable, a vaccination, an IV. But I also think... Um, we know ways to do that in standalone trials as well. So, you know, I could imagine a trial that, that uh, studies dummy products to sort of give people a direct head-to-head -head comparison of those kinds of modalities. But I think we need to be thinking dig uh, deeper along the lines of what I was discussing in my talk, which is as the field uh, becomes more complex, we need to figure out how to capture the enthusiasm, which is kind of broad in general, uh, at the ground level in the community for this research to an enthusiasm for learning about the nuance of, uh, of this because folks need to understand uh, where a particular trial sits in the context of the bigger research picture, exactly what was said that earlier, that maybe a less effective trial is important now or important for certain populations, but it doesn't stop the work. And then these more difficult concepts that go along with newer products, antibodies, and those sorts of things, I think raising the level of sort of research literacy around uh, the new complexity of this work is going to pay off in the long run. Great. Super uh, helpful and, and such a great um, response. I know we're just past the top of the hour. Um, I will pause. If there's anyone with a quick burning question, you can hit star 7 to unmute yourself. Um, I realize we are running late. And I know a few people are dropping off. But any questions or comments real quickly? Well, let me just, there was a question actually, as we do with all the webinars, people you know, can submit questions even before the calls. And there was one that came in um, that, that is always so striking. And I, I have a feeling, I don't know who asked it, um, I think it might be asked differently after hearing the two of you talk. And, and, but the question was, is there any hope? Um, and I think sometimes over 37 years of the epidemic and 34 or 5 years of HIV vaccine research and 21 years of vaccine awareness days, a sense of challenge and frustration, but also uh, you both presented the incredible opportunities that are ahead of us. So perhaps just the best way to end is to get you both to reflect on what, what, what is making you hopeful, excited, um, energized, um, and how might you want um, to, to move us forward? Well, I'd be happy to jump in there and just say, um, personally, I have a huge amount of hope. I've been living with HIV for 30 years, and my perception is that every single one of those years has been more hopeful than the year before. Uh, prevention is a different challenge, but we continue to make inroads into something that's very complex. But also, as I look around me, if you ask me, does the community have hope, I think we have very strong evidence of that, given that folks have been willing to enroll without a lot of coaxing into a lot of large trials that are ongoing at this time that have significant burdens of participation on those folks. And so people um, remain hopeful, they remain engaged, and, and that's just what I see from my point of view. Fantastic. Sandy? I'll keep it brief, but I'll just say that I um, have – the fact that we're living in a time where we have – two to three, depending on how you define them, ongoing efficacy trials in parallel uh, is really, you know, rare if not unprecedented and, um, well, that's it. it's rare, <coughs> sorry, and there's great hope for those trials, but the fact that we're not just resting back and waiting for them, we have a very active early pipeline following up behind them means that, yes, we're just con continuing to build upon what we've learned uh, the, in the years prior. So I am quite hopeful. The, the key, that I think, to sustaining this is um, the science, the enthusiasm, the participation, the communication has been wonderful. What we need to do is sustain funding to be able to keep these things moving forward. 
beautifully said, Sandy. Um, I, I think for all of us at AVAC, I think we, we derive enormous hope um, and um, just, just uh, excitement from hearing both perspectives today. Just yours, Sandy, from a scientist, yours, Mark, from a community, but the, 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 the overwhelming connections between the two. And I think for me, one of the most um, exciting moments is that you both talked about this importance of, of breaking down silos. Um, and that's both around science from treatment, prevention, cure, vaccine, prep, um, it is all one larger research enterprise, and then breaking down the silos between the funders and the researchers and the advocates and the trial participants and the policymakers, and and the breaking silos and building bridges that I think came out of both of your talks um, really is um, uh, the best way to think about um, uh, HIV Vaccine Awareness Day. And I really want to just thank you, Mark, particularly the slide you put up of all the different Awareness Days, and it is overwhelming. Um, and the important message to, I think, in all of this is that this is um, um, a critical part of um, uh, the, the HIV response, and it's not just for any one day, whether that's about a population or a, or a product, that, that it's about this work being sustained throughout, as you said, Sandy. So I want to thank both of you so very, very much. Uh, as you end your day, Sandy, in Thailand, and begin your day, uh, Mark, uh, in Washington, en route to Nashville, and, and everybody else in between, thank you. Um, and we look forward to many, many more conversations. Thank you all. Have great days. Cheers. And we'll be posting the recording and the slides again online, and um, we'll keep these conversations going. All the best, everyone. Thanks, everyone.